All righty. Uh, thank you all for coming out on a rather dreary uh, January day, particularly uh, as it's a Friday. So I appreciate your uh, coming out today. Uh, welcome to the first Chase's lecture of the semester. Chase's is an acronym for the Center for the History of Agriculture Science and the Environment of the South, which uh, seeks to encourage historical research in the course, some of the course ranks of the history department, history of science, agricultural history, and uh, environmental history. We're very pleased to welcome uh, Douglas McCleary to Mississippi State. Uh, Doug carved out a genuinely impressive career uh, after graduating from the other MSU, uh, Michigan State University. Um, despite that handicap, he worked for seven years as a field forester for the U.S. Forest Service in Northern California before segueing uh, briefly, kind of briefly anyway, uh, into the private sector where uh, he worked for the National Forest Products Association as a forest policy analyst. In uh, 1981, uh, and from really from 1981 to 1987, uh, he served as the USDA's Deputy Assistant Secretary for Natural Resources and the Environment before returning to the Forest Service. Uh, among other things, he's the author of American Forests, uh, A History of Resiliency and Recovery, which was originally published in 1992 was went through multiple printings and was revised and updated in 2011. Um, though I knew of his book, I first met Doug uh, through the Forest History Society with uh, co-publisher, uh, the journal that uh, my colleague Stephen Brain and I co-edit, uh, Environmental History. Um, so it's a real pleasure uh, to have him down to Mississippi State uh, to deliver a very timely talk on a subject that's attracted a lot of attention in recent years. Wildfires. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming Doug McClear. Well, happy to be here and uh, welcome. I don't have a mic and I don't speak really loudly, so I don't know whether you, some of you want to come down a little closer, but I'll try to speak up as well as I can. Can everybody hear me all right? Good. Uh, um, a couple of other things that um, pertain to this talk is, is I was, a, 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 amongst other things, working in Northern California. I was a firefighter. Uh, when I came back to uh, Washington, I worked on um, the cohesive strategy for dealing with wildfire. Uh, I also was uh, detailed uh, in 2003 to the Senate Agriculture Committee uh, when they were when the, the, the Senate was taking up the Healthy Forest Restoration Act, which was federal legislation to help communities sort of overcome the barriers for for dealing with fuels treatment in and around communities and watersheds, and that that bill that legislation was successfully passed in December of 2003, and and has um, been moderately effective in getting com allowing communities to get the job done but there's a lot of still a lot of barriers so what I'm going to talk about is so uh, is going back to the history of how did these forests what were they like and how did they get in the shape that they're in and that's what I'm going to focus this talk on um, we see these images for the last de a decade or two of, of catastrophic wildfires in the, f in the west. They almost uh, become a rite of passage in the summer, like disaster movies and lurid romance novels. We see these firefighters trekking off to slay the fire dragon and towns at risk of destruction. Uh, large, expensive homes going up in the flames. Um, and uh, and uh, often tragic aftermath. This is a, story, this is a picture of uh, paradise. Two years ago, were, were a, at least 85 people were killed, and I'm sure you heard a lot about that. We're gonna talk some more about how that happened. Um, but they just don't deal with he, uh, wealthy communities. Uh, Pueblos de Taos in New Mexico, the wildfire approaching the Pueblo and the amount of watershed damage and habitat loss to wildfires has have been pretty significant in the last few years. Uh, and we've also seen skies over San Francisco 
uh, Seattle, other cities smoked in for uh, years at a time, for months at a time, uh, and and then last well in 2018 and 17, uh, m many of the national parks out west, Glacier and Yellowstone, uh, were smoked in, and um, with uh, with the you know often uh, fairly significant health effects. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about the art and science of firefighting. It's, as you might imagine, pretty uh, dirty, dangerous, and back-breaking back back work. Uh, the strategy is get to them as soon as possible. We put out, typically, 98% of the fires or more. Uh, the ones you, that hit the news are the ones that don't get out in, in a day or two. Uh, often, fire is used to fight fire in, in two um, approaches. One, the most common is burnouts, is when you put a fire line next to a, a fire, you may, and you've probably seen pictures of it, um, use, a, use a water drip torch or fusee to light the, un, um, the uh, vegetation between the fire line and the fire to, to uh, b make the fire line more effective. The other one is a backfire, where you actually set a fire and send it towards the, the main fire. This is not done very often, but when it is done properly, it can be very effective, where the updraft from the f approaching fire brings the backfire into it, and when they meet in the middle, it's a pretty spectacular uh, joining of fire that just goes up to, up to the uh, heavens and then backs down if you've done it right. Um, the the big the news is of these fires are quite often looking at, at air tankers, and uh, they get pretty impressive. This is a DC-10, uh, has a huge volume, um, dropping uh, retardant, but th this is not effective unless there's people on the ground. Uh, it, it only slows the fire, keeps it from moving forward, uh, and allows the f crew to get, get a line around it. When I was fighting fire, it was a few years ago, they were using surplus World War II B-17s. And uh, this is a picture I took with my little 35 millimeter camera at the time of a B-17 dropping retardant. And, uh, that was about back in 1970, and when this ha when this happens, you got to be. I took the picture and, and dodged behind a tree because within a couple of seconds it it hits you, and it can be dangerous. Um, it comes out in chunks sometimes. People have been killed by the t retardant. That doesn't happen very often, but it's a it's a kind of a form of a. A fertilizer that desiccate or that covers the trees and makes them fire resistant uh, in the vegetation. It uh, uh, one of the things you know is be, like a fertilizer. Every little cut and scratch you might have on you really stings when you get hit with the stuff. Uh, talk about um, some of the techniques. Th these are pictures I took uh, of. Um, uh, some fires. Uh, uh, this is uh, this is in Southern California, in San Bernardino. San Bernardino. Uh, we were flown down from Northern California, about a four-hour flight or five-hour flight down, and when we flew in, these hills were. The, it, it was a Santa Ana wind was behind it. Fire was going from hillside to hillside. You could see fire from the plane r ripping up the slopes. Um, and I'll tell you, on the way, it was, it was kind of a um, jovial flight down until we got over that fire. And then the plane got very silent. Um, and one guy back in the plane after a few seconds said, please, Mr. Custer, I don't want to go. <laughs> but the, the day after we arrived, um, the wind stopped, the Santa Ana wind stopped, and so we could get close to the fire, and the technique here is to build a fire line 
as close as you can to um, where the fire burned. And this shows you the sort of the, the technique. Um, uh, a crew here uh, trying to clear the line as close to the fire as possible. This is a, a subsequent slide. And this is the completed fire line. The only thing that remains is to burn out all the vegetation, unburned vegetation in the, in the, uh, towards the fire uh, so that if the wind does come back, it has a chance of holding and uh, build a trench. Um, anyway, this is uh, my friend uh, Milt Mortensen sort of panning for the camera. And uh, when you can get water on it with a, with a tanker like this, it makes it a lot easier. But you do need to have a, a water source for this. It doesn't hold that, many, that much water. You have to have a, a stream or a, or a small pond or something to draw water on for this to be effective. And then the heavy artillery is also, if you can get it in, it makes a huge difference. This is a fire camp. Uh, it was pretty chilly uh, with the tools. Uh, friend Wayne Chandler sort of re resting after, at the end of the day, they have two, sh you have two shifts, generally a night shift, the day shift. The night shift is where you can get in close to the fire where it tends, things to go, tend to go down. Uh, the fire dies down and you can get in close, but it's also more dangerous at night um, with falling rocks that you can't see coming down the slope and things like that, and snags. Um, this is both the kitchen and di the dining room and the bedroom. Uh, th th on this fire, we had a little evening entertainment. I think it was an Apache fire crew came in. They took, took a, a uh, cot and used it as a drum and started uh, singing their traditional uh, songs. It was uh, actually pretty nice. Fire brings a lot of diverse people together for a single cause. OK, that's a, enough on the technique. Now the history. This is um, a, a fire tower on the ranger district that I uh, used to work on, uh, on the Tahoe National Forest. This is on the, the, the crest of the Sierra Nevada. Just on the other side of this, towards the way we're looking, is Paradise, maybe 10 miles north, northwest of this. Um, it's a uh, uh, sort of iconic fire tower. Um, and you can, I don't know if you can see here, but there's, a, there's stairs going up to this right here when you get up on top. It's a spectacular view. Uh, it was a, a very effective fire lookout. We had about four or five of them on the uh, district. Um, now they're using cameras, um, infrared cameras that can pinpoint the fire very directly and don't need anybody up there. Um, this is a the Raised Peak Fire, a fairly minor fire on, on the Ranger District. We got to the fire fairly rapidly. We got a line around it. This is a picture I took. But when we got there, we learned that a, a smoke jumper had been killed fly, uh, dropping into this fire. Uh, he, uh, they were testing. Uh, longer static lines at the time. And in this case, they didn't test it well enough because it got wrapped around his neck and broke his neck. And was, he was uh, dead before he hit the ground. Um, between 2000 and 2019, 341 firefighters have been killed on the job. During bad fire years, $2 billion in public funds are, are go to fire suppression. That's federal funds. Additional state and private funds are expended. In 2008 alone, it was $3 billion for just suppression. 
uh, in California uh, in 2017, the, the, the property losses were about $10 billion. And in 2018, probably $30 billion. That was the year Paradise went up, as well as the car fire in Redding. Why is California always in the news? Well, it's got an ideal climate for wildfire, a Mediterranean climate where it rains or snows much of the winter, three or four um, or more months in the winter, rain or snow, and then it clears off and you may not get any rain for the next three months or four months. It's, it's actually getting longer between the rainy season or the wet season and the dry season. And so all this vegetation which has had all the, this rain, all this moisture to grow, uh, mat matures, dries out, and becomes fodder for, um, for fire. And um, lots of ignition source, human ignition, but where, where I work, most of our fires were from lightning. You'd have a lightning storm go by, sometimes at night, sometimes during the daytime, and then a sort of a string of a line of of smokes in a long as the as lightning strike went, un, went under the, the cloud. Sometimes you get rain and sometimes you don't. Hopefully you get a little bit of rain to keep it down so you can get to it in a hurry. And so um, th th that's what's happened. We've seen uh, the area burned um, increase over, over the years, in the last couple, three decades and the uh, average wildfire size get larger, get larger. Some of this increase is because we use tech, instead of uh, putting the fire out a, a, as a matter of course, as, as forest policy, we may today let the fire burn if it's actually, it's a, it started as a wildfire, but it's, if it's doing some, uh, some positive things for the environment, clearing fo forest and and opening things up, uh, assuming it's natural. Today, the policy has been changed so we can let that fire burn for longer than we used to. So some of this increase may be due to that. Um, but the major thing that's really changed in the last 30 years is the uh, movement of subdivisions into the forest, it's especially in California, or, um, Montana, Oregon, Washington, um, these areas have their own acronym, uh, Wildland Ur Urban Interface, or WUI. And uh, at, at a minimum, 30% of the new homes that are going up in the West are in this kind of area. I've heard estimates that up to 60% are. Um, it's led to a, a large increase in deaths due to firefighters because they tend to make a little bit more effort than sometimes is rational given that people's property and homes at, or perhaps lives are at stake. And uh, only about 15% of the area burned is in, in the wildland urban interface, but it counts for uh, the vast bulk of the cost because the firefighters are no longer fighting fires in the hinterland like they used to. They're fighting fires around these communities. Uh, the car fire, and the, the big, biggest year that California has had is 2018. Last year wasn't anywhere near as large. Um, uh, the car fire, this is near where I used to work, um, near Redding, up in, uh, I li lived in Hayfork. It um, was a, a, a number of fatalities there and then in, in Paradise as well. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about that, but uh, when things really blow up, you can't put people, men and women, firefighters in front of it. You just have to get back and sort of herd the fire along the perimeters, um, try to protect communities, but uh, it's too dangerous to be out in front. So let's uh, sort of examine where things how, what things were like and how did they get to be where they are now. Are we, is it just prolonged drought or, or claims of climate change, bad forest management? We hear lots of 
fingers being pointed uh, or just sort of the vagaries of the weather or something else. Actually, it's, it's a fairly complex set of things that are going on. Um, there's a quote from Einstein, if you're out to describe the truth, leave elegance to the tailor. Much of what the press covers is only a small piece of, of, of the, uh, the reality. Um, let's uh, look at, uh, we're dealing with history here, and it's important to understand that history. Uh, Thoreau said, if we attended more to the history of our woodlots, we would manage them more wisely. And that's very, very true. Prior to European uh, settlement, fire played a, a huge role in, in uh, all force in, in um, the Americas, uh, in, in, in the West as well. In the West, the role uh, of fire was very, quite varied depending on the particular climatic regime that was involved, the elevation, the aspect, the topography, weather patterns, whether it's a north slope or south slope, um, all that affected the role that fire played. In, in warmer, drier forests, there were frequent low intensity fires that created open stands and savannas with relatively sparse overstory. Um, also prairies were created by frequent fire. In the cooler, more higher elevation, north slopes, uh, fires were more infrequent, but often of much higher tense intensity, uh, and they killed stands covering a few acres to tens of thousands of acres. And many, many forests had mixed fire regimes. In some years, they were they, low intensity fires went through, and in other years, when you were in a drought situation, or the wind was intense, you had stand replacing fire. So a lot of that western forest was a mixed fire regime. Um, also, human beings uh, were a major part in shaping the ecology of the western forest, as well as the forests in this area. Um, people arrived in North America 14,000 years ago. They brought fire with them. Uh, and. Uh, fire actually allowed them to make the trip. They used fire extensively as a land management tool. Um, some of the examples are the uh, quotes from the early, earliest observers and uh, West, Western observers, uh, European observers. Um, uh, Conquistador de Vaca said, the Indians of the interior go with brands in the hands firing the plains and the forests within their reach, that mosquitoes may fly away, and at the same time to drive li out lizards and other things from the earth for them to eat. In this way, they appease their hunger two or three times in the year. Three centuries later, uh, they were still burning. Uh, surveying the boundary between North Carolina and Georgia, this uh, surveyor wrote that the greatest inconvenience we experienced arose from the smoke occasioned by the annual custom of the Indians burning the woods. These fires scattered over a vast extent of country made, and made beautiful and brilliant appearances at night, particularly when ascending the sides of the mountains. Roger Williams in New England talk about this, wrote that this burning of the woods to them they count as a benefit, both for destroying a vermin and keeping down the weeds and thickets. John Smith, Jamestown, talked about how open the forests were, that a man may gallop a horse anywhere under these uh, woods, but where the creeks and rivers will follow. The woods don't look, look like that now. You can't gallop a horse anywhere through the woods of Virginia in most places. Uh, the reasons for the use of fire were varied, uh, and, but that was uh, ubiquitous. Uh, and, uh, and many reasons create uh, uh, particularly to create habitat favorable to the species that the uh, uh, indigenous people preferred. Uh, yet, uh, one of the barriers we have is uh, a perception today that the forests of the Americas uh, 
uh, were essentially pristine, uninfluenced by humans until Europeans arrived. And uh, we have uh, a lot of people who don't want to see any change to the forests of today, in spite of the vast evidence that they are much different today than they used to be. And we'll have a really look at um, what, did, what did they actually look like um, co uh, compared with today. Uh, we, we have a, an abundance of re repeat photography, not, not in the east because it was too early for photography, but in the west, uh, photography was developed in a, in, a, uh, in a timely way that would allow us to make these uh, patterns evident. And they almost universally show an expansion of forest and woodlands since the 1880s and a pattern of increasing forest density and uh, volume per acre, as well as the reduction of the diversity of the forest, the patchiness of the forest. And we're going to look at, the, at some photos of the Black Hills um, taken during the 1874 uh, Custer uh, expedition. They, they took a um, photographer with them, uh, William Ilford, an uh, uh, English uh, photographer, and uh, they went back, people went back uh, and retook these photos, essentially a, a, a century later, and we can sh see, and they took them on, at the, on the same photo points, the same time, day of the year, and the same day of the, uh, hour of the day that these original photos were taken. And we can uh, take a look at those. But first, let's talk about this expedition. It, probably uh, 1,000 to 1,200 men and one woman who was a cook. Um, George Bird Grinnell was another f person who became famous who uh, was on that expedition as a scientist. Um, this is a picture of, uh, of uh, Custer and two aides. They were, uh, and his, uh, uh, his uh, Ricker a scout, bloody knife. Um, these two aides were lucky enough to not to go with the Custer two years later uh, to the Little Bighorn, but uh, Bloody Knife did. And uh, the story goes that Bloody Knife, uh, who was Custer's, one of his most trusted scouts, um, warned him and tried to get him to not go down where he was going. He said, you know, this was not a good idea, and uh, when he was, he saw that he was going to not be able to persuade Custer to back off. He, the story is that he looked up at the sun and he made a sign and he said, "I will not see you set behind the hills tonight," and he did not. Um, this was an illegal expedition against the treaty with the Sioux Nation, and it led to the. Uh, discovery of gold in the Black Hills and the loss of the uh, Black Hills uh, to the uh, Sioux Nation. Two years later, of course, uh, uh, Sitting Bull and Crazy Horse had their revenge, at least temporarily. And, uh, and, and that, uh, uh, but go beyond that. This, this is a picture of the Black Hills, one piece of the Black Hills in 1874. Look, look at the vegetation over here, uh, aspen and uh, some young conifers. A um, hundred years later, it looks like this. Another photograph, uh, look, look at, at this, where the Conifer stop here, the uh, aspen and hardwoods over here. This is what it looked, looks a, hundred, a century later. Another one, um, and a century later. There was a lot more fire in the landscape 100, 
uh, in the in the mid 1800s as, and as then has occurred since then. This is a, a photo of Montana, 1875. Same photo point um, in 1980. Um, this area has since burned. Uh, south Fork of the Teton River on the Lewis and Clark in 1899 and 1981. And this is, th these are, these are, this was happening everywhere in the West. Um, what, what caused these things? Certainly a major reduction in, in the fire that was on the landscape. And then only later, probably in the, in the, in the late 40s and early 50s uh, when organized fire suppression became uh, successful. This is a, uh, a picture of a ponderosa pine cross section from Arizona. You can see the, and it, and it, this shows the record of, of uh, uh, light fires, low intensity fires going through here, non-lethal fires beginning in 1540, 1550, you know, and it goes up 1616. And it, it doesn't stop during the, at the era of, of effective fire control. It stopped in the 1880s, 70s. And uh, two things happened in the 1880s. One, native indigenous peoples were taken off the land as effective agents of management. And two, millions and millions of uh, sheep and cattle were brought in, which changed that dr dramatically the fuel situation there and the, the ability of fire to carry through. This is a, just a picture of the, of the I mean, it was just a, a sheep overpopulation in the West for several decades and it just changed the whole uh, fuel situation out there, the ability to carry fire, and also all those hooves created a mineral seed bed for for um, seedlings, tree seedlings to to grow in, without competition from grass. Another thing that happened early on, this was when the Forest Service was only five years old, just a toddler. The Idaho Montana fires uh, were. Um, profoundly affected the psychology of the of, of the Forest Service. Uh, Seventy-eight um, fire, Forest Service firefighters were killed. Three million acres were burned. Um, actually, 87 people died, including the 78 firefighters, which was the bulk of the fatalities. And this really changed and, and created a, a, a culture of. Let's, we've got to put out every fire. It's, it ushered in the aggressive fire uh, prevention, fire suppression. So all fires were then put out, whether they were good fire or whether they were uh, doing any good or not. There, were, there was quite a bit of pushback by those who didn't think this was a good policy, uh, promoted light burning to reduce fuels uh, but um, they were sort of drowned out by the Forest Service's campaign to uh, denigrate the light burners and uh, 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 refer to them as in a, in a, in a denigrated way of, as Paiute forestry or Paiute foresters. Um, and so we're living with that today. And, and this is, this is a, some other evidence about what, uh, these are photos um, uh, taken by, uh, from uh, Forest Service lookouts showing what the uh, landscape looked like. This is 1936, showing the, um, the, the love openings. This is a south slope. There would be light uh, fires that would come up here periodically. Uh, non-lethal fires, and, and it just was a, a relatively pa patchy situation. It was, it was probably less patchy in this, in this um, photograph than it was 
30 or 40 years earlier when the fire dynamics changed and, and uh, indigenous peoples were no longer burning. But it's still, this is in 1912, I mean 2012, showing how the forest has closed in, become more continu con continuous. Again, uh, in 34, showing what the fo forest looked like and in, in 1910. I mean, in 2010, um, much more continuous forest carry fire. Um, in, in addition to, to having a, a, a more continuous fuel um, ladder with no, less broken up by openings, uh, these forests have become uh, unhealthy. The moisture stress, these are moisture stressed ecosystems and, and w when, uh, trees that would survive uh, drought uh, when there was less competition, less uh, trees on the landscape succumb to bark beetles and, and you know, other insects. And this, this shows sort of um, a, um, a example of sort of the types of forest, how that change occurred. This is a south slope, which is um, open, and where frequent low intensity fire comes through here. This is a far higher elevation, maybe a north slope, drier, I mean, more moist, um, uh, more humid. You don't get many fires in here, but when you do, it, it's, you may, might, might get a small lethal fire here. And in the higher elevations, um, pretty fire resistant. Uh, this is, again, what might, might happen um, where you get a, a lethal fire here, but nothing down here. Um, today, this is more what you see. Um, and then uh, with uh, things drying out, climate change and um, more mortality in, 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 in the forest, and then people deciding to put their homes uh, in these forests, uh, it's, not, uh, uh, un it's not surprising what's going on and very difficult to, to control. The, the press talks, if you paid attention to it, of a century of fire suppression. Well, I think the, the Forest Service wanted to put all fires out in, in 1920, a century ago, but they really didn't have the capability of, to do so. The, the, the forests were, many were inaccessible, um, and they didn't have the uh, personnel or the equipment or the communications to, to do so. But they certainly did by the 1950s and um, became, uh, fire suppression efforts have become very effective or be, became very effective and uh, uh, continued to lead to the conditions that we're in. Uh, so we've seen this fire regime shift. Probably more than 60% uh, of Western forests are formerly frequent low intensity fires. We're in frequent low intensity fire regimes. Many of these forests are now in infrequent, high intensity fire regimes. Most residential L L re developments are in these former uh, infrequent low intensity fire regimes. And this shows in the interior Columbia Basin uh, how f uh, high, severe, f high severity fire regimes have increased and low intensity fire regimes has, have declined substantially. Smokey has taken a little bit of flack for this, or a lot of flack, uh, but his message I think is still um, important that we need to keep unwanted fire out of the forest. The, the problem was that forest managers didn't do what they should have to promote thinning and fuels treatment and the use of controlled fires. Uh, the light burners I think have been uh, vindicated here by uh, by what history has shown. <laughs>
Um, but uh, not putting fires out and setting controlled fires is, is a, a fairly complex, politically fraught uh, issue. Uh, you can fight fires or you're a hero. If you put out a prescribed fire to do some good and it gets away and, and damages or threatens the community or puts smoke, smoke in the air, you're a villain. Uh, and that's the problem. And we're, we just don't have the, the, the social license to do it on the scale that's needed today. And we, it is possible to make a, a major um, change in uh, where things are. Uh, we not, can't necessarily uh, go back, turn back the clock, but there are a lot of things that can be done to restore forest ecosystems um, and reduce the risk to human communities. Um, thinning and controlled use of fire, th this is something that's going on at, at a, a reasonable scale, but not anywhere near enough. Um, this is what the forest looked like before treatment and trying to restore it to a, a semblance of what it was in the past. Another couple of pictures, again, to try to bring it back to a low intensity fire regime. Because you're not gonna keep fire out entirely, but you're gonna to wanna to create a forest in which it's resilient and uh, that fire is not uh, lethal. This is a sequence of, of treatment from uh, the Lake Creek Experimental Forest in Montana. That's before treatment. This is after the thinning, uh, putting some fire there in the evening what it looked like right afterwards and then uh, a year later. This is the kind of thing that is being done, needs to be done, a lot more of it needs to be done. Um, this is uh, Wally Covington from Arizona has been doing, uh, done for years, a lot of work in this area. You can see this um, ponderosa pine here and this thicket. This area had, uh, uh, frequent low intensity fire before 1876. That was the last fire that occurred in this area, similar to that cross section, ponderosa pine cross section you saw. Uh, in, in 1876, there were 23 trees per acre. Uh, prior to thinning, there were over a thousand trees per acre. This is what it looked like after restoration. This is a more fire resilient, it's much more rich ec ecologically, um, much more rich from a wildlife and um, plant standpoint. And this is what we should be doing a lot of. Um, and what, what, does, what can we do to change fire behavior? This is sort of an accidental example where they, they uh, produce a shaded fuel break here in, in Washington on the Tyee Creek fire, thinned out the fires, separated the crowns, reduced the, the uh, pruned it up. A fire came through, hit the treated area, and then went through and then went back a, as a crown fire. Pretty uh, important example of how fuels treatment can change fire behavior. This is a picture of the Blacks Mountain Experiment for, Forest in, in California. Uh, they had lots of um, uh, experiments going on here, civil cultural experiments. The fire came here, the, the wind came in here, unthinned, a complete crown fire. It hit the thinned area and, and went out, went into it a couple hundred feet and just, just went out. The fire, there weren't any, any firefighters needed. It just, it just petered out. Uh, this shows what, if no treatment is done, most destruction occurs. Um, uh, this is, um, let me see, B, this is just thinning without um, uh, burning, prescribed fire. The, the, the best way to do it is both to thin and then run fire through it. That gives you the most protection. Even old growth forests, um, uh, are being choked out by um, vegetation. Uh, young seedlings coming in. These were uh, 
in order to protect old growth forests, we're, we're going to need actually to do some treatment. Um, it, you know, it can be uh, a lot of old growth forests have, that are untreated have gone up in, in smoke. These are forests in, in, in the frequent low intensity fire regime areas in the eastern, eastern Washington, Oregon, and, uh, and the Great Plains area. But going in and doing any kind of treatment within old growth, it can be very controversial and, and um, create the uh, um, very, a difficult situation to move forward. Fuels treatment is also important for um, protecting communities. This, this shows um, a schematic of what can be done, a system called FireWise and dispensable, de Defensible Space, which is commonly used out, out west and, and uh, in the Midwest as well. Clearing um, fire safe zones around communities, which varies between, uh, uh, as, as to how close you are to the, the building. And um, this, can get, this can make a, a huge difference in, in, in protecting communities. Um, uh, we also have uh, climate change. Uh, we're in, in the West, fire season has extended um, by more than a month. In California, maybe two months. Some say it's almost a 12-month fire season these days. Uh, weather has become more erratic, droughts more common. Uh, we've had Santa Ana winds, which are called, these winds coming off the desert uh, from the east are called Santa Ana's in the south and Diablo winds farther north in the, in the northern or central um, Sierras. Diablo is, a, is Spanish for a devil. Uh, but um, the reality is that fuel conditions today were more, if they were more like they had been in the 1880s, climate change wouldn't be the, 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 the factor that it is today. So it's a combination of, of a change in force and climate change which has created this situation. This shows um, uh, the temperature change between, uh, between 1895 and 2018 showing that California has, has, um, has got some um, like 2%, 2 percent, 2 degrees centigrade uh, increase uh, average temperatures in several parts, some of which are, are very fire prone areas. And nobody, it, this is almost as much temperature change as, as, it, as is occurring in parts of the uh, Arctic. P climate scientists don't know exactly why this is occurring. It's not occurring elsewhere. It's not occurring here to that degree, degree or in other parts of the West, but it is in California. Paradise, November 6th. November 6th should have been sort of, in my experience out there, that the fire season usually was over by the end of, uh, end of September, not this year. Uh, it was known to be an area of, of, of very hazardous situation. It, the town grew uh, from about 5,000 people in the, in the 60s to 27,000 in the uh, 2018. Two fires had, uh, had threatened um, the, the town, had uh, uh, burned several houses. There were um, limited escape routes, um, but, and they had, they had um, the response was to set evacuation plans so that it would be, if a fire came, it would be staged evacuation. They really didn't do the fuels treatment that was necessary to, uh, to deal with the situation. But in uh, November of 18, a fire started um, outside of town, driven by high winds, probably started, started by a PG&E power line, and moved so fast that the evacuation plans 
that couldn't it just t turned into panic. There weren't any fire safe zones within the community, so everybody had wanted to get out, and there just it was it wasn't they weren't able to. Um, it, it they've had they had um, uh, uh, Diablo winds, a very dry vegetation situation. Um, 85 people were killed. 19,000 buildings were destroyed. It was uh, uh, more than the 10 worst fire in uh, fire disasters in California history. Tw 10 times worse. Um, property damage near 10 billion. Um, and uh, there are the, paradise is typical of many towns. Um, there, it, it lies in Butte County. There was a Firewise um, program. Um, people knew about it, but they really didn't take advantage of it. As I said, you know, treatment requires treating the fuels, reducing ladder. These are ladder fuels are branches. You, you prune up trees so you can, the fire doesn't go up into the crowns. Once it gets to the crowns, it's a, essentially um, very difficult to control. Um, this is a picture of, of the town before the fire. Pretty continuous crowns across here. N no place to go to um, in the event of a fire and, and very limited evacuation routes. This is an a experimental uh, area just a few miles from um, uh, Paradise, e ecological area, showing what pr probably what the area looked like a hundred years ago. More open, more prairie, scattered trees. Um, the, the, the head of the, of the ecological area, uh, Don Haskins, uh, has been working to study this and, and working with Paradise to come up with um, fire uh, over the practices. He's, he, he works with indigenous communities and he studies the d indigenous fire practices. Um, a field I hadn't heard of before, before I talked to him, pyogeography, he calls it. Pyrogeography. Anyway, it, it's to, to to look at the the landscape and and historical indigenous fire practices and to try to adapt to current practices to uh, to take advantage of that that um, um, that knowledge, traditional knowledge. So it's not it's not rocket science. It's more social science on how you go about this. Um, it's, it's, the costs are, are achievable. Um, it, it's not expensive, it, but it does require uh, social action, active participation, and a few dissenters can slow things and, or bring things to a halt. Um, uh, also, th there's some, some problems with um, laws and, and being able to you know, enforce it. In Southern California, if a landowner doesn't take the proper measures to treat fuels around their property, the county can come in and do it themselves and send them a bill or, or, or add it to their tax bill. In other parts, um, that's not, that, that's not uh, the case. Fire insurance is going to be a, a major um, incentive. Uh, when I just I started working on the uh, in the Washington office on the issue of the fire strategies, we invited the insurance companies in to because we felt that they were an important part of the mix. At that time, this was 20 years ago. They um, said it's not worth it to us. We don't our loss profile is insignificant to, to, to fires, uh, residential fires. Um, that's, not their case, that's not their view anymore. Um, uh, at least one 
insurance company, small one, local, has gone out of business as a result of the Paradise Fire. Uh, I've got a colleague who lives near Paradise in a little town called Sierra, uh, Nevada City. And it's, 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 called the, it's, it's on the west side of the Sierras in California, an old gold mining town. And his, his insurance was canceled a few months ago. Uh, big insurers have, uh, have uh, all of them just did blanket cancellations. He said cancellation by zip code, even though he had done treatment and, uh, and, and could verify the treatment around, the around his house, uh, he still lost his insurance. He finally got insurance from a, a lower tier company but his deductible is $42,000. And that's, um, so the first $42,000 of loss is not gonna be covered if there's a fire that goes through. I'm not sure how, how long that's gonna be politically viable to, uh, to people living there, but um, we, we, we see um, these, uh, Barriers, um, including the, the, the will to do it, the people there in the community saying, I came here to be around trees and I don't want to do anything. And uh, a few people can make, make it very difficult. Um, another thing that are the liability laws for escape fires, which, which uh, uh, make it difficult to, to get the incentive to, to do fuels treatment um, it, it's expensive, um, and there's a general lack of understanding of how these forests have changed in the last hundred years. Um, so, um, it, uh, we have a regulatory bias today that tends to favor delay in weighing the short term negative impacts of treatment more than the long-term benefits um, of, of moving forward. Um, it's, it's also a, a major cost issue, but I think we're seeing the resources now after the last year or two um, that maybe will, will change this. Um, so the, the bottom line is uh, sort of the three-headed dragon of the western fire situation. Um, the densification of the forest in the last century or more, expanded residential development and climate change. Um, the national cohesive strategy, wildland fire strategy, um, has three elements. Protecting communities and watersheds, restoring landscapes, uh, through mechanical treatment and fire, and more uh, flexibility in management of wildfires. The wildfires that aren't doing a lot of damage are, are being herded rather than putting them out. So um, let's talk a little bit about what's been in the news um, lately, Australia. And there are some similarities, but some differences between what's going on in the West. Uh, it's just horrific what's happened there. Uh, climate change is probably more, of a, uh, no doubt, more of a factor here. Uh, three years of drought, high winds. Uh, 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 we've seen seen just unprecedented. Uh, these are. Exact. These are fires like nothing they've seen in the past, even though fire is a, has been uh, something they've lived with for decades, for centuries. Something like what has occurred this year is, is, uh, is uh, unprecedented. I think it's, it's gonna create some, some major impetus for social change uh, that uh, ramifications that we uh, are not really uh, I'm going to I mean we, we can't really anticipate 
This shows um, uh, the example of the area burned in, in, um, in Australia. This is what burned two million acres in California in 2018. Um, 2070, 1.2, just last year, it, they had a, a, a pretty mild fire season. Earlier this year, the African, uh, the Amazon rainforest, 11 million acres. This, at the time this slide was, t was made, it was 14 million acres. Today, it's estimated at 24 million acres. So this circle should be almost twice as big as, that, as this one. I mean, the, the scale of the loss in Australia compared with California or the Amazon is just boggles the mind. Um, and, and the pictures coming out of this are, are, are pretty hard to take. Um, the, the, the size and scale of this, it's just, it's hard to get your mind around it. Loss of homes. Um, one of the differences in, with Australia is that many of the firefighters are volunteers. They have, uh, th this, this is just a job they do on the side. And uh, of course they, uh, they have, a, 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 they work uh, and, and, and fight fire on the side. Of course, um, uh, this, uh, this, is, this is what, uh, what we used to look like after at, at the end of a fire. Uh, this is the smoke. That's, the smoke that's been hanging in in um, Australia is uh, causing all sorts of of um, health problems. Fire, uh, smoke alarms are going off in buildings just from the fires. Uh, it gives you a sense of that. And this is in New Zealand, 1,600 miles away, Auckland, New Zealand. It's also, the fire smoke has also blanketed New Zealand, uh, put soot all over their glaciers, which will all make them uh, uh, melt all the faster. And uh, it's just amazing what uh, the scale of, of the disaster there. People on the beach waiting to be evacuated. Similar, I mean, Lack of vegetation management and climate change are both factors with what's going on in Aust Australia and, and the West. But climate change uh, has got, uh, is more of a factor. Um, forest vegetation is more dense, or just like it is in the West. Historically, Aboriginal use of fire was a major factor in reducing risk from wildfire. And they've got people talking about going back and, and utilizing that experience um, in current management. Um, uh, the differences are the forest vegetation is different. Uh, eucalypts are much, are, are very volatile. The leaves can curl up and catch fire in them and they, and they can be carried for 20 miles with fire still in them and then drop down and start a fire. So. How you stop a, how you stop that um, is uh, is a, 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 a almost impossible. Um, in the U.S., it's been more use of professional firefighting forces, less use of volunteer, more money and equipment is devoted to the task in in the West. But I'm not sure, given the weather and the wind and the drought, that that would have made all that much difference. Um, Anyway, um, I've gone on, on long enough. Um, it's a very much of a social problem, not just a technical problem. It's taken decades to get where we are, and uh, oh, it's going to take us a long time to get out, especially if we don't understand more of the history of our forests than we seem to be willing to understand. Anyway, thank you for your time.
Okay. Yeah. Uh, so it seems like every fire that happens, you know, this 2020, 2019, or doesn't happen for that matter, is understood in the culture as connected to humans in some way, right? Um, it's because you didn't rip your forest, it's because of climate change, it's because you built your house too close to where the fire is, it's because of, of the, you know, the, the state government, no, it's the federal government. So it, I think everything everything that happens in the contemporary moment is understood through the lens of human action or inaction. Could you speak, you know, whether from your own experience fighting fires in, 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 a, in a different era or just from what you what you've learned in your research as to as to whether that was as front of mind in in other times, and, and if not, how did this, you know, was, have we just passed a sort of a cultural tipping point where this becomes our paradigm? Uh, could, could you speak to that at all? Well, um, yeah, I, when I when I was uh, out there fighting fire on, on this, there, there weren't these, we, we didn't have developments that were embedded in the forest. and. Most we, we went out and fought fire in the forest, and so it was a whole different dynamic if, than if you're spending all your time protecting communities that have arose arisen there. Uh, which which t talking to colleagues, that's that's what they're doing now. So it's it's much more of a shift from protecting the resource and and to than to than it is now to protecting communities, and and coupled with that is. Is uh, is the uh, uh, fire seasons are longer and more intense? Uh, pr the fire weather is more erratic and difficult to predict. P put, putting people out there is riskier. The, the kind of fire behaviors that uh, I, I've seen uh, that are going on are things that I just I just can't imagine what, being out there and trying to fight fire in those conditions. It, so there's there's those are the two things, communities and more erratic fire and longer fire seasons um, are, the, are the difference in, in terms of how, how, how firefighting is different now than it was years ago. I, I don't know if I answered. So, so you, you would say that, that the, the, the change in the discourse is in fact a direct result of the change in the actual fires, or, or at least the, 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 the we're seeing more as, as human caused or, or human implicated because they are they are happening in closer proximity to human than in, in different ways. Yeah, in, in that in people's homes are are at risk, and I mean, and and at some point they're going to it's going to be there. There are towns there that if we well, you get very erratic fire, and it just won't make any sense to put people's lives at risk. The, the town is a warren of, of, of dead ends and difficult uh, how, how, trying to get equipment in there, trying to get people in there in that kind of a, a messy situation. Um, it's just, um, it's not, we're not going to be able to do it. Um, and, and this is something that, like I say, is, has developed in the last 30 years. It, to the, and it's getting it's getting worse, and I think maybe um, the reaction to, to what's going on. I mean, the insurance the insurance situation I described is going to become intolerable to people, and they're going to be talking to their political representatives to do something about it. And what if we get something like we do with flood insurance, where governments forced by political pressure to 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 subsidize these often very wealthy communities against fire risk. And that's, that's gonna be a, um, you know, create, create some very bad situations where, again, people are, it's not gonna be a disincentive to continue to, to put communities out in these areas or to not to do the fuels treatment that they need. I mean, a lot of these communities could very easily be protected, um, and, and I didn't mention there's also building techniques that you can use that make a, a building itself. You you you, you fire resistant siding, you um, 
uh, eliminate gutters. You put screens in in the in the in the uh, vents so the embers don't vert, fine screens, not the normal ones you, you get at the hardware, to get, get ember the embers go into the attic. Quite often these these buildings will don't catch on fire immediately, but then they catch on fire five, ten minutes or after the fire went out because of embers have gotten in. Um, you can tempered glass to prevent glass from breaking from heat and embers going in and starting. There's a lot of things that can be done. These are not necessarily, I mean, that, that are things that you can do that are easier to do than protecting community from, from uh, in a flood zone. You're going to get flood, flooding periodically. There's not much you can do about it. Here, here's something that if, if, you, if you take precaution, you, you can't eliminate risk entirely, but you can do a lot to reduce the risk to your community, to your home, by just being, uh, being smart about it. But again, you, it's got to be a collective effort. One homeowner can't do it alone. You, you've got to have the whole community doing that kind of treatment. Otherwise, it's not going to be effective. Related to the insurance, to um, you, you talk about how you know withdrawing insurance is maybe going to change homeowner behavior and, and maybe even local community behavior. But is there a sense in which um, the sort of rise or in personal insurance or like property insurance for individuals and the federal assistance changed the way the fires were fought? I mean, you describe how firefighters feel this obligation to save property and save homes. Um, yeah. But that kind of flies in the face of, you know, until recently there's insurance for those homes, assuming that, you know, personal safety is, is taken care of. Right. Um, is there, so is there a shift in tactics, or I guess it's really wherever the fire is? Yeah, I mean, it, um, I'm, I'm not sure what the, what, what uh, the, the, there is a tendency of firefighters to, to put, um, uh, uh, when s somebody's home and at risk, uh, uh, often uh, uh, to, 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 to do, go beyond what they would normally feel comfortable with doing if it was just a wildland fire in the, in the hinterland. Um, even though it's, it's property damage and, and it's, just, it's a property, damage, uh, property that may or may not be covered by insurance. But, um, but I, I think uh, how, how the insurance story plays out is is just unfolding today because people I mean th these are th these are things that are just have just occurred in the last year as a result of the paradise fire <laughs> and so w what what insurance companies ultimately do and what the politicians do in response to the outcry of what the insurance companies are doing is yet to be written we I don't really have a sense of that but, uh, okay, um, I've got a question about those comparison photos you, sh you showed, which one's taken in the 1870s and one taken in the 1970s. Um, can test plots where human activity is minimized, where the fires aren't set, fires aren't suppressed, the land isn't grazed, houses aren't built, can, can, if there are test plots like that, can they tell us which of those two photos is the anomalous one, is the one where things would naturally trend toward if humans didn't, didn't, uh, change, the, change the balance. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm... Say that again, I'm trying to... Well, it's two questions, I guess. Are there test plots uh, near, in nearby regions where, where, uh, where a fire isn't suppressed where, or fires aren't started, where the land isn't grazed, where the, the land is left to do what it would do without human interference? And if so, can the, do those test plots tell us which of those photos, the 1875 to 1975 photos, are um, anomalous. By anomaly, you. Which way would the which way would the land look if humans didn't do anything or if they weren't there? I don't think. I I, I don't. Uh, the answer is I don't believe that there are test plots, and I think it would be very difficult to to um, to, to you can make make some judgments as to what would happen if there weren't people there. But I, I think um, 
uh, what what you're seeing with those photos in the West and what what people talked about, the early early explorers talked about uh, of summers, which with lots of smoke in the air, caused they said by in Indian burning, and so there was a, there was a lot of a human caused fire on the landscape, and there probably had been for centuries before, and and what what that would look like absent that. I, I think you could you, you can tr you could maybe model that uh, using the models we have today, but um, uh, I, I you know the only ignition source other than humans would be lightning, and you could you'd have to model what, what what's what's the average lightning um, occurrence, um, and there's quite a bit of lightning out there, but but. I'm sure, I mean, but not enough to have created those, those Black Hills photos in the 1840s. I mean, there just isn't that much in the Black Hills. Those are clearly human, hum, human uh, created landscapes. And, and uh, what I saw is just a, a small subset of all the photos that uh, Illworth took. There, there are scores of other photos that, that show in different parts of the Black Hills. Those were the ones I showed that were most illustrative of, of the forest, but, but they all showed essentially the same. Um, in the drier parts of the Black Hills, it didn't show anywhere near as much change, but, but there weren't that much, there wasn't that much forest. I mean, it, it showed some, one of the photos show, showed a dead tree a, a snag, a ponderosa pine snag, in, in 1740. I mean, in 1774, and in, in, in 1976 or whenever they took it again, the, the snag was still there, and many of the branches were still there. That was a hundred years later. That's a pretty dry site, but many of them were not. Any, hope this was useful. <laughs>